It is that time now once again For getting lumped up with my friends It's rock a mic And Rob that you should know And you'll find them here on the rock show Hello people and welcome once again to another episode of America Favorite Podcast and Japan, The Rock Show, <laughs> episode 104. And man, do we have a show for you guys today. And we're talking about the incredible Robert Johnson. Did he sell his soul to the devil or he did it? Rock and Mike is here. Rock and Mike is here to tell us the story. Mike yeah, got a story well, for us, a lot of information, and Mike, take it, take the show on. Let's go. <laughs> Hi, hello everybody. I'm Rocker Mike, and this is the second week of Black History Month, February 2021. Oh, this uh, is episode 104. Also. Oh, this uh, is episode 104. Also. Right, right. Last week we talked about uh, what did we talk about last week. Uh, we talked about Sun House. That's right, Sun House. And this week we got Robert Johnson. It's a nice what little a story. segue because they knew each other. Okay, so it, it works. Uh, we are 102 in Japan in the Apple charts last time around. Yep. We're more popular than Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. You just have to mention that. <laughs> okay. Hey, um, <laughs> Mike, you know what's funny? You were talking about this and they were actually looking for Robert Johnson and they found... Sun House, that's pretty funny that that because, yeah, because, uh, yeah, it's crazy, it, yeah. I mean, you know, in those days, news didn't travel fast and and records were wrong, or maybe people didn't believe them because they were wrong so much. So, when Sun House was being searched for, uh, I mean, they when it was searching for Robert Johnson, they actually found Sun House, and Muddy Waters was kind of the linchpin and all that, like, he knew where these guys were, so they spoke to Muddy first and then. You know, got the Sun House. But that was last week. And this week we're talking about Robert Johnson. All right. So he was born in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, May 8th, 1911, uh, approximately. Remember, these dates are all approximates. Um, his mother was named Julia Major Dodds. And his father was Noah Johnson. Though he didn't know about his father until he was a teenager. Okay. Uh, his mother, Julia was married to Charles Dodds, who was kind of like a, uh, a landowner, pretty much. He, he had some property, I think a uh, cotton field kind of thing, um, in Mississippi. They had 10 children together, but Robert was not one of their kids. She had a little, little uh, incident on the side, and Robert was kind of like an illegitimate kid, even though Dodd was raising him. Uh, but he didn't know this growing up right away. Uh, Dodds got into some problems. He he got he took on a lynch mob, basically. Okay, <laughs> and his deal was he had to get the hell out of town. So he left. Um, Julia left Hazelhurst with the young Robert Johnson for a little while. Okay, who was going by the name of Dodds. He didn't use the name Johnson. It was Robert Dodds. Uh, eventually they would end up after about two years back with Charles Dodds. He was in Memphis and he had changed his name to Charles Spencer because I, I think they were going to kill him. All right. So, so they, were, they were pretty much looking for him, right? That's what it was. Uh, well, I, I guess he, he, he got far enough away. Maybe they stopped looking for him, but he didn't use the name anymore. He had to change his name to, to Spencer. Um, Julia would would leave Robert with his stepfather, okay? And for the next, like, eight or nine years, he lived and went to school in Memphis. And it was here that he developed his love for music, uh, particularly the blues. Robert would reunite with his mother in about 1920 or so. And uh, after she remarried a sharecropper named Will Dusty Willis. Uh, so... Whatever happened with the marriage with Dodd, I guess, once he got in trouble, that was done. Yeah. She ended up remarrying, and eventually Robert would come back to her. Uh, they would settle in Arkansas and then finally in Mississippi 
in the Delta area, a place called Robbinsville, which is very important in, in blues culture. A lot of people pass through there, play there, things like that. Um, they were living at a place called the Abbey and Leatherman Plantation. And Julia had married Dusty, and he was 24 years younger than her. Wow. Yeah. yeah Let me yeah. ask you a, a question. What do they mean by plantation? What is a plantation, actually? Well, in the South, okay, they had, you know, uh, people had land, and uh, it was called a plantation. Usually there was like, you know, in slave times, obviously the slaves did all the work, but this was yeah. in 19, this was in the 1920s. Um, there was no more slavery, but but black people in the South still worked on plantations, usually okay. with cotton fields or some kind of product that was being grown. Uh, you know, maybe uh, vegetables, fruit. You know, there were fruit plantations, things like okay. that. Yeah, you know, it could be anything, but. They basically had like workers. A hundred years earlier, they would have been slaves, you know. But they, they, these were like southern rural blacks working on plantations. I, I, they were whites too. It wasn't just all right. Black. All right, but, uh, that's actually yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of the neighbors uh, called Robert Little Robert Dusty after his after his stepfather, uh, but he was still technically Robert Spencer at that point. Uh, yeah, he he didn't, you know, he, he would take on that that uh, dusty. He didn't have, I don't think he ever took on the Willis name. He was using Spencer. Um, now, despite a tough early life, Robert was very well educated. In fact, he was more educated than most people at the time. Uh, he did go to some good schools when he was in Memphis. Uh, so, going back to a rural environment, he kind of had a leg up as far as education. Uh, one thing he knew how to play by the time he was 13 was the harmonica. He was very good at playing that. Um, as a teenager, his mother informed him that his father was really a guy named Robert, uh, was a guy named Noah Johnson, okay? Uh, it came as a shock, obviously, okay? Uh, not sure about how she told him, but she did tell him. And uh, at that point, he just started using the name Robert Johnson from then on. And he, when he was in his late teens, about uh, 19, 18, 19, he got involved with this girl named Virginia Travis. Uh, yeah. When he, when he was 18, she was 16. Yeah. And they got, they got married and she was pregnant and she died. In childbirth, the baby died also. And it was like, you know, a tragic event for him in his life. Uh, it had to be because really after that, he was never the same. People that knew him said he was kind of different after that. And uh, he had made a conscious decision to make music his life. He wanted to be a, a traveling blues musician. Uh, he knew how to play guitar a little bit. Um, he could play the harmonica, and this is what he was going to pursue. Um, getting back to Sun House for a second, Sun, Sun moved to Robbinsville, okay, where Robert Johnson was. And the reason he moved there was because he wanted to be closer to his musical partner, Willie Brown. We talked about that last week. They played together. Yeah. Um, Robert met them. OK, uh, and started kind of hanging out with him. And he was about 10 years younger than Sun House. Uh, yeah. But he he looked at Sun House and said, I want to play like you. And what would happen is, uh, you know, Sun House and Willie Brown would be playing and uh, Robert would be watching. And maybe they go in, you know, in between performances, they go outside, have a smoke or a drink get some air and Robert would pick up their guitars and Robert would try to play and Sunhouse is on record saying like he was awful he couldn't play yeah and the audience used to come out and, and you know talk to one of them and say hey can you get that guy from stop playing your guitar because he's terrible you know that kind of thing and uh, he was a good harmonica player at that point but it wasn't really enough to be a blues musician, just to know the harmonica. You had to know guitar, okay? 
So Robert would leave Robbinsville. And this is when it gets a little mysterious. I mean, so much about Johnson's life is not known. Okay. But you know so what? Much... Some people yeah. are saying the thing with Virginia, the reason some people believe like um, the relatives of Virginia really think that it was a curse because he was playing, they considered that kind of music, the devil's music at that time also, that blues. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, remember even Son House didn't want to play at first. Yeah. Okay. He thought it was the devil's music. Blues music in 1920s and 30s had a connotation. You were kind of an unsavory person. Yeah. You were definitely, you know, you were a womanizer. You, you, you know, there were other musicians. A drunk or uh, everything. Dr <laughs> drunk or even maybe a drug addict in some ways. Yeah. I mean, there was always, marijuana was always around, you know, but that was jazz musicians too. Um, but, uh, Definitely, you know, you, you, it was not a lifestyle that, that your parents wanted to see you get into. It's crazy, okay. man. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, he would leave in 1930 for about eight months. Some say he, he tried to find his, his father, his natural father, Noah Johnson, in the Martinsville, Mississippi area that supposedly he was in. Okay, but no one knows for sure if he ever saw his father, met him or not. Uh, it was during this time, though, that he was really practicing his guitar playing, okay? Because he wanted to be as good as Son House. He wanted to play just like him. He met a guy named Isaiah Zimmerman, also known as yeah. Ike, Zim Ike Zimmerman. And he was a popular blues guitar player. And, you know, it's rumored that he, he gave him some lessons, possibly, but one thing about Zimmerman is he already had a reputation, okay, that he kind of got his talent from playing in graveyards. At midnight. Right? At midnight, right. It was believed if you played your guitar at midnight, you would get supernatural powers to play the guitar. Maybe the devil was involved, things like that. Um, after eight months, Robert returned to Robbinsville. And he reconnected with Son House and Willie Brown, who was still there. Uh, his guitar skills were incredible at that point. Incredible. When Son House and Willie Brown saw him play, they couldn't believe it was the same person. Nah. You know, like how did he how did he learn in eight months to play that good? Okay, he was probably better than them at that point. You know, and when something like that would happen in those days, you know, people would immediately assume you did something to make that happen. OK, yeah. so a, a lot of the legends about him selling his soul to the devil, which we'll talk about a little more later. Um, you know, that's how that kind of that stuff kind of begun. All right. Was was like people were like that knew him to not be the greatest guitar player and then to come back after a few months. And no one really knew where he was. You know, it wasn't like he kept in touch with anyone and said, hey, I'm, I'm, in, I'm five towns over or something like that. You know, he just disappeared, didn't know where he was. And he would, this is a trait that he would do, okay, going forward in his life. He had friends uh, that he would play with from time to time uh, that would just lose track of him. He would disappear. And all of a sudden, Johnson, you know, you might go, travel to another town and he'd be there and no one no one knew where he was before so you, mike you, know. you want to hear something crazy about him yeah he's also part of the 27 club i was going to say that yes yes he <laughs> died. in fact i would say he's the first one yeah that we know of. okay yeah uh, think about yeah. all those guys Bad success. Maybe they all did a deal too, and that's what they made success in twenty seven with well, the number. Well, I mean, remember, look, if if he sold his soul, okay, to play this music, what did this music turn into? Everything, rock and roll, you know? right? Yeah. So everything, you know, in in the sixties when that whole thing, that whole stream of people, starting with Brian Jones, Brian Jones turned Keith Richards on to Robert Johnson. He bought him the record King of the Delta Blues, which came out in 1961. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and he gave it to Keith Richards. 
Now, Keith, Keith's on record saying, you know, I thought I knew the blues until I heard that. Yeah. yeah I'll go into more of that, more of that later. Um, you know what's was, funny? His skill was so good that sometimes it sounded like there were two guitars playing. Yes. Yes. Uh, in fact, mentioning Keith Richards, when he first heard Robert Johnson and Brian Jones was, was playing the record for him, he said to Brian, who's the other guitar player? <laughs> he was convinced there was another guitar. No, it was just one. And it, you know, I, I, it's funny because when I first heard Robert Johnson, I didn't realize that. I, I didn't hear the two guitars. But then I read about it and I listened to it and I said, ah, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. All right. You know, you just, because you're hearing such an old recording, you're not sure of the quality. But then when you really listen, you're like, it does sound like two guitars, but it's not. And it's no trick in the, in the recording. They didn't have shit like that in those days. You know, yeah. just a live recording, you know. But when he was in Martinsville, uh, he fathered a child with a woman named uh, Virginia May Smith. Didn't have anything to do with her after that. Um, I think this child actually is the only heir that's ever been recognized. And I think this child has the fortune. He's got the money from all the Robert Johnson recordings. Um, he would instead, though, he married a woman named Coletta Kraft in 1931. They would settle briefly in the Clarksdale, Mississippi area in 1932, but the marriage wouldn't last. Uh, he would leave her that year to go be a traveling musician. Uh, and sadly, Coletta would pass away the next year. Okay. Now, as a traveling musician from 1932 until his death, in 1938 he played mostly in the mississippi delta area but he would occasionally travel far distances he would go to canada played new york city chicago texas st louis a bunch of other cities in that area he uh, got around man he got around what he wanted to but a lot of times he just stayed in the delta area um one guy that played with him often on these uh, these longer trips was a guy named Johnny Shines, okay, and uh, he was a, a, a you know blues blues guitarist, friend to Robert Johnson, probably knew him as well as anybody did, okay, because Robert kept to himself. It was hard to to really know the guy. He was very quiet, reserved. Uh, when he would do his recordings, and we'll talk about this in a minute, he would he would he turned around. He didn't want anybody looking at him. Yeah, um, I heard that too. That was weird. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? A uh, few people have done that over the years, and I've always felt it's not so much that they don't want somebody watching; it's just they don't want anybody seeing how you're playing. All right, picking up tricks that you do. Okay, but you know what? By him doing that, when he did that recording of that album with those guys, it it, it bounced off from the wall because he was facing the wall. So yeah, it created some yeah. kind of sound. Yeah, um, there are some theories that he knew about this that the sound would be a certain way if it bounced off the wall in the corner of the room where he was. I've I've read uh, different uh, theories about that. Some people say no, that that you know it it. it it doesn't matter. There's no way he could have known that. But it's possible. I mean, he was very talented. And I'm sure he knew. One thing, too, is he had a great voice. Yeah. And his voice was very, I guess, soulful is the word, but almost like melancholy. Yeah. Okay. He had a very melanch melancholy kind of voice that combined with the tone of his guitar it's like perfect. It's it's just a perfect tone for the way it he was plays. a perfect it was harmony. It was like a perfect harmony between yeah yeah between the guitar and the vocal. Okay, you know it and, makes sense. Uh, and not too many people, not too many people can pull that off, especially when you're playing at the same time as you're singing. Okay, yeah. But um, uh, Johnson himself 
Bartho, uh, one thing that was known about him, he was a bit of a player when it came to the ladies. Okay. Uh, he would, you know, go do these long trips, maybe go to New York, but he would only do it if he could stay with a girl that he knew there. Like he knew girls in, in all different cities. Um, sometimes though, he would travel under different names and a lot of these women, they didn't even know his real name. Wow. Um, so he would say, all right, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go play a blues club in, in Harlem. He'd have some woman here. He might be playing under the name Johnson, maybe not. So they wouldn't even know. Okay. okay. But sometimes he would also, like if he arrived in a new town, he, he would uh, play popular songs on the street for, for change, for street on street yeah. corners. Uh, yeah, they talk or, about. You know, he did that shots. a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, and and um, you know, he would play outside restaurants for some change. Everybody yeah. would just, if they heard him, they would, they would. He was so good, they would just give him money. Um, yeah, he had a lot of so he had a lot of songs in his repertoire. There was a lot of songs that like were not his songs that he knew how to play. Uh, but some of the darker songs that he has. Okay, uh, he he didn't play them live, uh, you know. And we'll talk about some of these songs. Um, one thing that he could do is he had a knack for kind of hearing a song and knowing how to play it. Yeah, that's weird. Uh, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I always, I whenever I see somebody that does that, that always blows my mind. Like, how do you do that? Like, I, you know, I would need like five days to figure that out. You know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but some people, you know, I mean, we, we've talked about this in the show. Different different guitar players, they'll hear something and they'll just be like, all right, here, give me the guitar and just do it. I mean, yeah. It was a Peter, Ta Peter Tosh, right? Yeah. Peter Tosh, he, 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 could, he could listen to a guy play for hours, take the guitar and play exactly what he did. Yeah, that's then, incredible. You know, there was that one time he did that and the guy said, how'd you learn to play? He said, I watched you. You know, and the guy was his mind was blown. Exactly. You know, um, he also enjoyed. Uh, he, he's been. He was known to say that he enjoyed jazz, and he also particularly liked country music, which I found very interesting. I didn't know that when I researched it. You know what? I, I can't see that. Had he had had he had he lived, Rob? You know, would he have maybe done a, a country record? Just oh, he would definitely, yeah, he would have definitely done one because that's like, you know what? If you're a Delta Blues, you can easily go and do some great country music, especially a one man guitar with him. It would have been great. Yeah, like if he had lived, he could have had a band, okay, a whole bunch of guys playing with him. And so who knows what that would have been? Uh, you could have had rock and roll 10 years earlier. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe even earlier than that. Um, he always managed to please his audiences. They, they loved watching him play live, uh, even if he didn't, didn't always use his name, <laughs> whatever name he was using. Um, and whenever he came back to a town, they were happy to see him. They, they, they welcomed him back. You know, so he didn't, he didn't burn any bridges. He did very well. Uh, he, he, liked to, he liked to travel and play, and that's what he did. Um, in 1936, he went to Jackson, Mississippi in search of a guy named H.C. Spear. Uh, he was a known talent scout in Jackson. And Spear connected him with a guy named Ernie Ertle. Okay. And Ernie was a, a salesman for the ARC company, which is the American Recording Company. Okay. It was basically a record label. And uh, it was through Ernie that he met Don Law. Who yeah, was Don Law. record Robert. Yeah. yeah. And he would travel to San Antonio, Texas to do a recording. Uh, Robert Johnson would only record two times in his life. Okay. 29 songs. That's all we got. All right. Uh, one thing that's interesting about his, his repertoire of music is in those 29 songs, there's a lot of alternate takes. So it's really not, it's not 29 different songs. What he did particularly on this first session in San Antonio, is he would do alternate takes of everything, which people didn't really do in those days. 
You know, so he was kind of a little ahead of his time with that. Um, yes, he was. Uh, in November of 1930, right, in, in November of 36, particularly over the 23rd through the 25th, which I'm figuring is Thanksgiving time, uh, he recorded in the Gunter Hotel with Don Law, okay, room 414 to be exact. I think you can go there, okay, I think it, it still exists. Um, there was a label named Brunswick Records that was going to put out this, this record. All right. And in those days when they made records, you didn't really go into this, you know, recording studio so much that you see today or even 20 years later in the 50s. They would record you live. And a lot of times it was done in hotels. OK. Um, and they recorded you directly on to the vinyl. And everything in those days was 78s. You ever see a 78, Rob? No, how does that look? Okay. It, it, well, a 78 uh, looks almost like a regular, you know, 33 and a third album, okay? Except the speed is 78. It's faster. Okay. Okay. It's faster. All right. In fact, in fact it's faster than a, right, like, you know, a, a 45, the little singles we used to get, that was 45 revolutions per minute. Albums are 33 and a third revolutions per minute. This was 78. And the 78s were, were interesting. They were very heavy. Okay. A little smaller than a 33. Maybe almost like a 10-inch. That's about how wide they were. And um, when they recorded that, it was recorded right onto like a blank 78. And they would press the records right there. Okay. Wow. It said you'd have your one, you you know, you had your one uh, model, and then the rest would be, you know, pressed later. But um, over those three days, he played sixteen songs, and like I said, recorded some alternate takes on them. Most of them actually. And Mike, he you ever wonder? Sing a wall. Yeah. You ever wonder how they put music on a record? How was the record? What made the record? Was it the lines? What was it about the record that you could get sound out of it? A round thing with a needle and it gets it's sound. How was it? Yeah, it's the it's, groove. It's incredible. It's, in, it's it's the grooves. Yeah, yeah. It's in the grooves, and the needle put like, you know what? I don't even know. I can't even say. All right. It's yeah, a, it's but think how incredible that is. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, you know who invented that, right? Who? Thomas Edison. Oh yeah. Yeah, he invented the phonograph. <laughs> probably probably Tesla, but who the fuck knows? Right? Yeah, he probably <laughs> stole it from Tesla. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's what I'm saying. You know. Um and like I said, when he was recording over those three days, he faced a wall. Uh you know, and I, I, I think it's because he didn't want anybody to steal his style of playing. I didn't think he wanted anybody to watch him. Okay. Um, a lot of guitarists have done that. Now, he recorded the song Come On In My Kitchen, Kind Hearted Woman Blues, uh, I Believe I'll Dust My Broom, uh, Crossroad Blues. He recorded Terraplane Blues, which actually would be the first single released on 78. Uh, and then a song called Last Fair Deal. Came, I'm sorry, Last Fair Deal Came Down. That's the name yeah. of that song. Um, uh, Terraplane Blues was sort of a hit. It actually sold about 5,000 copies in the South. It was sort of a regional hit, and it was in jukeboxes. So people did hear that song. Um, he never got bigger than that. Okay, unfortunately, he wouldn't live much longer. Um, one thing that Law, Don Law noticed, is that Johnson could record very easily. He had a sense in the process. Uh, he, he knew how to fit his song into a three minute format, which was what the 78 single was just like the 45s later on. Okay. okay. Basically a three minute single. Okay. So he, he had a knack to doing that. And it was important because, you know, a lot of things were done in one take and you had to get the song within that three minutes. You didn't want to, play too long you had to you know get it to a point where it was going to end so you had to know 
how long you were playing for. He had a knack for that, so he was good at it. Um, after the hit, which was Terra Plain Blues, the minor regional hit, he would then travel in June of 1937 to Dallas, Texas, for a different recording session, another one, same record company, Brunswick. Uh, he would record with Don Law again, and yep. this was located in the Vitagraph building in Dallas. The old Vitagraph building actually would become Warner Brothers. That's where they yeah. started, out of Vitagraph. Uh, 11 songs will be recorded here and released over the next year. Uh, he did all, some alternate takes on these as well. Now, this is where it gets, you know, we don't know what happened. We know that that was in night, June of 37. By, you know, between that time in August of 1938, he performed live. He, live, he traveled around. But on August 16th of 1938, he would die under mysterious circumstances. Uh, it was near a place called Greenwood, Mississippi. His death was never reported uh, publicly, and uh, you know, no autopsy was done of him. Um, in the years past his death, there was just many legends about it developed you know what happened to him so the one that's pretty much accepted these days is that he was poisoned by a jealous husband of a woman he flirted with yeah that's that's you know, what you hear all the show. time yeah yeah now basically what happened was if you believe this story is he had been playing for a few weeks at this country dance near greenwood Okay, uh, Mississippi and Johnson one night, uh, I think on stage, flirted with this married woman. Okay, and her husband got pissed off, he got angry. He supposedly poisoned a bottle of whiskey and made his wife give it to Robert Johnson. Now, whether she knew it was poison, I don't know. Okay, uh, he was playing at this dance with uh, another blues artist named Sonny Boy Williamson. He was famous in his own right as well. Um, when he saw Robert drinking from that bottle, he slapped it out of his hand. And he said, what's the matter with you? Don't ever drink from a bottle that you didn't see open. Okay, it was just an wow. like, open bottle. that, that you know, Because in those days, people would poison you. Okay? And you're dealing with black people in the South. You know, there was Jim Crow. You know, there was a lot of shit happening to them. And, uh, you know, they even poisoned each other sometimes, too, you know, but whatever. Um, so he told him, what's the matter with you? You know, don't do that. And Johnson was pissed. And he said, don't ever, don't ever touch, don't ever knock a bottle out of my hand again. Okay. Right after that, he received another bottle from the woman. And this was also poisoned, apparently. Uh, he drank it. And within a... The next day, he actually started to feel sick. It wasn't right away. Um, over the next three days, he had incredible pain, abdominal pain in his stomach, okay? And it would just get worse and worse and worse until he died, all right? Now, some people have said that it was strychnine put in there. But strychnine has like a particular smell that people knew. Yeah, he would have smelled it, yeah. Okay. And he, he, yeah, he probably would have known something was up because the whiskey wouldn't have been able to mask the smell of the strychnine. Um, there was also a common poison in the South that people used to make called uh, neph nephthalene, okay? And it's actually made from dissolved mothballs. Mothballs was something that everybody used to keep the bugs out of your clothes when they were hanging up in the closet or yeah. in boxes or wherever you kept them. Um, if you grind them up and dissolve them, you can make a poison out of it. But very rarely is it fatal. All right. But the thing with Johnson, it's believed he had a bunch of like underlying medical conditions that he may or may not have known about. Uh, one was he, he did have an ulcer. I'm sure he knew about that a stomach ulcer. Wow. Um, he also had something called uh, esophageal varices, okay? Basically, you get that 
when you're developing cirrhosis of the liver. So my guess is he probably had a bad drinking problem and he had an ulcer and he had this esophageal problem. Okay. They say he was uh, a heavy drinker. Yeah, he was a heavy drinker and uh, he, he also developed hypertension. Okay, which is very, very common when you when you're a heavy high drinker, blood well, high blood pressure and all that. Yeah. Now, one thing that he may have had also, uh, there's some theories, is that he had congenital syphilis. All right, and congenital syphilis is wow. He got it from his mother when he was in the womb. Okay, and it was possible his father gave it to him too. Okay, uh, you know, when, when when you have, if one of the parents has syphilis, it could be passed on to the yeah. kid. Okay, um, that, you know, I, I you know, I don't, I'm not sure how they, they've come up with these theories. I don't think they have too many medical records of Robert Johnson lying around. Okay, uh, people have tried to do a lot of research. I know that's, that's one thing that's been thrown out there that he might have had that. Um, now, officially... Um, well, when he died, all right, he basically, the, the witnesses said, because he died on a, kind of like a farm, okay, he was staying on like a house on a farm, and the person that owned the farm said that he was bleeding from his mouth for two days, um, you know, why he didn't go see a doctor or anything, I, I don't know, okay, I don't know if one was ever brought to him. Okay, so it's all very mysterious. Um, now, officially, the location of Robert Johnson's grave is not known, for sure. Okay, research that was done in the 1980s and 90s tracked his grave to a place called the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church near Morgan City, Mississippi. And it was actually an unmarked grave at the time when they discovered it. But... Columbia Records believed this to be the place. Uh, Columbia Records would release his music in the 60s and going forward. Uh, they basically put a giant obelisk right there as a marker. And they listed wow. all, all his songs on the obelisk. All right. Now, there's two other places that are recognized as possible grave sites. Uh, one is in Quito, Mississippi, and one is called uh, the Little Zion Church, and that's actually near Greenwood, where he passed away, okay? And wow. they both have markers there as well. So there's three places you can go if you're looking for Robert Johnson's grave. No one really knows for sure. You want to hear something that he did that nobody else did? I'm sorry? What was that? You you want you know you know what's another thing that he did that nobody else did? What? He played Carnegie Hall. I knew you were going to do that, and I, I'm going to bring that up in a minute. But first, I want to talk about <laughs> that, first. First, we're going to talk about a little conspiracy here, the Devil Legend. Okay. Yes. Now, we talked about it earlier that he supposedly sold his soul to the devil. And it was done at the crossroads, possibly the crossroads, of yeah. Highways 1 and 8 near Rosedale, Mississippi. Now, some say it was also at a crossroads in Memphis or maybe even in Clarksdale, Mississippi. But the idea was that if you went to the crossroads and waited for a man to appear out of the darkness at night, you would play your guitar and a man would appear. He would take the guitar from, from Robert Johnson, okay, and play something, tune the guitar, play something, and then hand it back. And if he accepted it, which he did, it meant that he sold his soul to be a great guitar player. And it also meant you'd be good with the ladies. <laughs> wow. Okay. So that's that's the... That's the that's the uh, the legend. All right. Um, <laughs> it, you, you know, I mean, it's it's weird. You know, is it real? I don't know. You know, there's there's been a few other musicians that have tried this. Okay, and they said they did it. So, not sure. 
you know, but it's it's you, uh, it's definitely an interesting legend. You want to hear something? Supposedly you go out there and you play and you don't even look at the man. You just give your guitar to the back and the guy tunes it, give it back to you. You become yeah, a you super don't, musician. You don't even have to look at him. Yeah, the other thing yeah, to say, you know who they say did that? Elvis. You ever heard that Elvis might have done that too? Yes. Yes, and, and I did hear that. And uh, oh god, um, I'm trying to think if it was somebody in the '60s, another guitar player might have done it. I'm sure that well, there were rumors with like the Stones and stuff because they did "Sympathy for the Devil" that they had sold their souls, <laughs> you know, like that kind of shit. Yeah, I mean, look, those legends, those like urban legends about rock and roll being evil and everything, that all goes back to the blues guys. Okay, yeah. that just followed that. All right. And uh, you know, it was it was you're talking about a deeply religious culture in the South, and you you're talking about this parallel lifestyle to that going on at the same time. You know, you didn't want your kid to grow up to be a blues guy, you know. You didn't. That was not what you wanted for your kid, because you knew it was gonna lead them down a road to hell, you know. So but I mean, he's left. He left behind a great legacy. Um, yeah. In 1961, the album "King of the Delta Blues." I mentioned this before. It was released by Columbia Records. Now, for many years, you couldn't you couldn't uh, find Robert Johnson. It was almost like uh, you know, but Terraplane Blues was one that you might be able to find a record because it was somewhat of a hit. Okay. Um, but you know, his other records, other singles were impossible to find. And when in the fifties and early sixties, when folk music and blues was making a big comeback, people wanted to find these Robert Johnson records in Columbia. I believe they bought the, the rights to Brunswick. Okay. And they were able wow. to release that stuff. They, they found, they found it. Well, Don, I think Don Law, I think was still alive. Okay. Uh, maybe by that point, I mean, he might have had something to do with it. He might have had master copies of Robert Johnson his whole time. I'm not sure. Okay, I'd have to I'd have to check. Um, but like I said, Brian Jones introduced Keith Richards. All right, and he, you know, he fell in love with Robert Johnson. The Stones covered "Love in Vain." They covered "Stop Breaking Down." Okay, and you know, Richards always said. If you want to really know the blues, you got to know Robert Johnson. Forget everybody else. Okay. Um, the White Stripes would do a great version of yeah. Stop Breaking Down as well. Um, Eric Clapton covered his music. Robert Plant, Bob Dylan, big Robert Johnson fan. And, you know, and, and you know, John, uh, John Hammond. Okay. I'm going to talk about the Carnegie Hall thing now. Keep in mind, John Hammond discovered Bob Dylan. Okay, yeah. so this is important. In 38, Don Law had recorded Johnson and met Columbia Records talent scout John Hammond Jr. Okay. Now he had discovered John Hammond Jr. discovered Billy Holiday, Count Basie, and later on Aretha Franklin, and later on Bob Dylan. But Hammond was putting together a concert um called From Spirituals to Swing in 1938. And it was supposed to be a history of American black music. Yeah. Right? And uh, on the bill was the Count Basie Orchestra, Albert Ammons, Joe Turner with Pete Johnson, Sister Rosetta Tharp, uh, uh, Jimmy Rushing, the Golden Gate Quartet, uh, and Robert Johnson. It sounds fantastic, okay. the whole show. Now, Hammond put him, yeah, but ha Hammond put him on the bill, but his appearance was not confirmed at all, okay? Uh, I think they were trying to find him, basically. Uh, they, Hammond put out a request to find Johnson and see if he could come. And that's when they found out that he had died on August 16th of that year. And he was 27, like we talked about. The uh, first one of the I 27 club. Hammond, the amazing, yeah, and the amazing thing that Hammond did is uh, 
he brought a turntable on stage at Carnegie Hall, and everybody got to hear Robert Johnson's records. He played them live in the in the in the hall. So that's, that's fantastic. Cool. You know, uh, yeah. So he he got his moment. He didn't live to see it, but his music got heard by a lot of people, and I guarantee you, people that were there, you know, went on to bigger things. Yeah. You know? Uh, but it would be like another really about 22, 23 years before, you know, Columbia put out the King of the Delta Blues. There would be another collection, I think, that would come out in the 60s. Um, and then there's this right here. Uh, this is something. OK, it's a box set. Um, keep in mind, too, there was only two pictures of Robert Johnson ever found. And that's one of them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's only two existing pictures. This is like a studio picture, okay, I guess for uh, Brunswick, I guess, when he was recording with them. Um, You know, and and all the songs are are here. Um, It comes with – this has been – this came out, I think, in 1990. uh, And it actually won a Grammy, this collection. Wow. Um, It's got a nice – Nice book. It's actually got the the lyrics to the songs. Um, yeah, this is the only other picture. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's that one and this one. Those are the only two existing pictures of Robert Johnson. Uh, you know this. This is Ike Ike Zimmerman. We. Talked about the guy that was playing in the graveyards. Yeah. Okay, that's him. Um, here's a picture of Howl and Wolf. Okay, who we're gonna talk about next week. Next week. Yeah. And I think, yeah, yeah, I believe he might have known Robert Johnson as well. Uh, all these guys knew each other. This, their son House. Yep. Okay. You see that, but this is a really good book, and it's cool because it's got word and everything. But it's a it's a two CD two CD set, and I, I you know you could always tell a, a serious music lover if they got this in their collection. You know, I've seen this in so I've seen this in so many people's houses. This collection, you know, it's very cool. So that's all I got for you today, Rob. Rob, my God, man, we wouldn't have rock and roll without him. You know, we wouldn't have rock and roll without the guy. What an incredible history. And the way you told the story, great work, Mike, because I know there, was a, there wasn't much about him. I saw a documentary. I saw an HBO one, and I saw another one that was uh, you recommended, both of the documentaries. I even saw the one on Netflix, and they were very similar, yeah. the story. that I wasn't bad. I, you know what? This guy was a um, pioneer. Yeah. He was a pioneer. Absolutely. He was a great fucking... Um, Delta blues guy, but from him, it's where we got all this great music, guitar playing, and rock and roll. And dude, the guy was a legend. And he was the first guy in the Twenty Seven Club. Yes, he was. And they might, you know, people might have been cursed after that. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Hendrix. But, yeah. Everybody. Yeah, I mean, but it, you know, he, you know, I always like to. Uh, so one thing we've done on the rock show since the beginning is we've always talked about certain bands or musicians, certain people that are like important points in the in the continuing thing of rock and roll. OK, people that, you know, you look at them and nothing was diff- nothing was the same after that. No. Nah. OK, he's one of these guys. He's one yeah. of these guys. OK. Uh, you know, had. Brian Jones not found that record. Keith Richards didn't know, you know, and he didn't know blues till later on. You know, it might have been different. Yeah. If if it would have been a whole different world. Was lost forever. Yeah, it would have been totally different. I mean, because I, you know, big big influence um, to so many people. I mean, Muddy Waters. Okay. Yeah. Which I Another think we're one. gonna. Do a show. We're going to do a special show on him later on in the year. Uh, you know, 
if Johnson wasn't around before him, you wouldn't have had Muddy. You wouldn't have had BB King. It would have been different. Yeah, you wouldn't have had none of that. It would have been a whole so, different, uh, yeah, it would have been a whole different thing. All these guys, you know, BB King, everybody, man. Uh, these guys all came from the uh, the Bruce, Hooker, man. Buddy yeah. guy, yeah, I mean, buddy so guy, many, so many of those guys. Yeah, um, and, and you know, sadly, a lot of these guys are no longer with us too. Yeah, and, uh, it's a shame. There aren't too, there aren't too many people around anymore doing this kind of music. I mean, there's some, but yeah, uh, you know, it, 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 the the old time. I mean, I like I could sit down and listen to a Sun House record. Yeah, you know, I just love Sun House. Uh, Robert Johnson too, but I also I like Alan Wolf. I also like Willie Dixon. You know, guys I like Led Belly. I like Led Belly to me. It's one of those Led guys. Belly, Char- Charlie Patton. Yep, yep. You yep. always say you like Led Belly, Charlie Patton. Uh, so many of these guys, and 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 the blues have been documented very well. You know, as far as the genre, there's so many books about it. You could just go crazy. You know. Yeah, there is. There's a lot of history. You get, and it's probably the most interesting of all. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, the, it's the beginning. If you like, it's if the you beginning. Love, if you love popular, you, yeah, I mean, it's really where it where it got started. So um, next week we're going to have How and Wolf. Can we? Uh, Very excited on social media. Yes, it's going to be a good show. If you want to find me on social media, I am on Instagram, Rocker Mike Two One Two, Rocker Mike Three on Twitter. And um, I am on Parlor Rocker Mike. I'm on MeWe under Rocker Mike. I'm on Facebook under Michael Baker. And then the Rock Show Podcast has a group page called the Rock Show Podcast Group Page with Rob Rossi and Rocker Mike. Check that out Mo- on Facebook. Join up with more members, yeah. man. More people are joining. More people are joining up. Have you heard? You said yeah. more people are joining yeah. up. Every day I approve a few people. I just go there and approve it, you know? Yeah, me too. Me too. So, yep. So it looked like we're looking up, man. Hopefully when can we one find day you, we... Rob? And you, you can find me anything lumped up, getting lumped up, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and even the, uh, the, 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 the um, what you call it? The webpage. And we also got, uh, we got t-shirts, we got merch, and another big thing that I'm really trying to get you guys to get, if you like the show, Go on to uh, Anchor and donate some cash so we can buy some equipment and get better material so we can do better shows, you know? The bigger the show, the yeah, better. More yeah, audio, yeah. more video, and more graphical. Yeah, uh, right now, we're on a very low budget, but you know what? People are coming around. We get a lot of people coming to the show. We get people that they telling us, hey, can I be on that show? <laughs> yeah, yeah we, do, we, 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 do, we do the best with what we got, right? Yeah. And you know what? For a bunch of guys that are not too super te- te- uh, technically savvy, we do pretty good. <laughs> yeah, we do okay. We keep it interesting. They want we keep it interesting. Stupid faces. <laughs> yeah. All, All right. right. See you guys right. next weekend. Remember, Rob? Don't get, get drunk. drunk. Get lumped up. Get lumped up. See you next week. All right, cool. Podcast you will hear that will be music to your ear. You'll learn about bands you love or may not know, and it's only here on the Rock Show. Let's get lumped up on the rock show.